Great. Hi everyone, my name is Amy Brown and I'm with the UTLC and the library and the UTLC are, are collaborating together to put together this series of webinars for everyone. It's called Online Learning and Innovation and you are the lucky ones that are here for the very first one, so thank you so much. Uh, in this series, we want to focus on different instructional technology, and we've asked that the instructional technology consultants and faculty cover different topics, such as online learning pedagogies, the instructional technology tools that we have here at UNCG, and more. So these are 30-minute webinars, so it's kind of really quick, kind of, kind of get you started. And we'll put them in the we recorded in the meeting center, and then we're going to put the recording very different places. So the library will have it, the UTLC will have it, uh, your ITC will still have it. So it'll be different places. And then once we're done with the recording, we'll send you a link. So if you want to come back and refer it, you can. Um, I'm going to hand over the presenting. Um, uh, here in just a moment to our presenter, but let me just go through some logistical things for you. If you notice to the right of your name, there should be a microphone that's red with a slash through it. So that's you muting your mic. So if you haven't done so, please go ahead and mute your mic. Perfect. So everyone has muted their mic. Which um, is, if you need to ask a question and you want to use your mic and ask the presenter directly, you can unmute that. Um, if you don't have a microphone, that's fine too. There's a chat room there at the bottom that you can ask that question. So before I get started, are there any questions? And I'll take your silence as no, if that's, if that's, if that's fine with me. Okay, so let me go ahead and introduce our presenter today. Uh, this session today is about making your Canvas course more accessible. And this webinar is being presented by Anita Walford. She's an ITC for the UNCG College of Arts and Sciences. And now I'm going to hand over the presenting abilities to Anita. Give me one second. Yep. Okay, thanks, Amy. It looks like um, I have control, so give me now just a second. I'm going to share uh, my browser, and I'm going to be showing you how to do some things in Canvas. So give me just a second to do that. And okay, so there we go. And let me make sure I can see the chat. Okay. So everyone should be able to now see uh, my Canvas browser on their screen, so hopefully that's working for everyone. Uh, let me know if it doesn't. Uh, so what I'm going to do is jump into a Canvas module and work in a Canvas item for most of this. Uh, a couple of things to mention first is uh, when we talk about ADA compliance, we're talking about basically Americans with Disabilities Act compliance. Um, this is federal law that the university is required uh, to be in compliance with. Uh, the first thing is there are several categories uh, for disability-related services. This can include things like uh, visually impaired, deaf, hard of hearing, attention deficit disorder, you can have uh, various mobility impairments, speech impairments, um, so several different categories. And we do have uh, many students at UNCG that fall under uh, one or more of these categories. Uh, I saw um, some statistics from uh, the ORS office, and these are a few years old, so if anything, the numbers have uh, gone up that 5% of UNCG students have some form of a learning disability um, and or 29% have an attention deficit disorder. So, and if anything, those numbers have increased. I know that we have uh, several students in the college as well as some faculty. I know that uh, the Bryan School um, has had to work with several students. I think School of Ed has too. So it is um, a, a common issue on campus. So uh, the first thing we'll look at is uh, how to make uh, just the basics, text and links. So I'm in Canvas, so I'm going to start out and I'm just going to add a content page. Um, and, add that. and then I'm going to edit it. So at this point, hopefully you've all used Canvas enough to be familiar with the basic uh, editing environment in Canvas. It's just basic, a basic Canvas content page. So when we're talking about um, text and links, there are several things to keep in mind. With text, uh, the first thing
thing you want to think about is color contrast, for example. When you're typing text in here, um, let's see if I can get some, so just some generic text here. Keep the color contrast. Uh, so black on white is always good. Uh, you want to think about, like, for example, if you, if you have this text and you go up and do a text color that's, you know, very light. Uh, you can't read that, so make sure that your color contrast is good. You don't have to stick with black on white, but keep it something, you know, dark text on a very light background. If you're going to do the opposite and do, for example, white text on a black background or something similar, you can do that, but keep that to minimum, like maybe one area to draw the eye to it. Don't do, you know, significant amounts of text that way. So that's the first thing, is just uh, color contrast. There are tools online that you can use that will check uh, your contrast. And at the end of this, I can give you uh, the web link to my resources page where you can you know, see the how-tos on everything I'm going to show you as well as some of these resource links. So that's the first thing is color contrast. Another thing is just to use the built-in tools for formatting. So one thing that that means is to use uh, your true heading. A lot of times, so let's say that we're making a content page and the first thing is, is you want a header that says welcome. I should not change my color back. Um, and then maybe you're going to go down here and you want to say, um, uh, for example, reading requirements. Like this. And so the welcome, the reading requirements, maybe these are uh, like subheadings for your page. What a lot of people have a tendency to do is they'll just highlight this and they'll make this bold, um, you know, maybe a bigger font uh, and move on like that. Uh, but if you'll notice, then they'll keep this as a paragraph when really this is your paragraph. What you want to do is change this over here and make it a header because when uh, screen readers read this text, then it will indicate to the students that this is a new section, a new section title. So, for example, make this a header H2, uh, heading 2. So, um, and then at this point, if you don't like the formatting that comes for the header that you've selected, you can still change um, the bold, the italics, the color, the font size. Just make sure that you have this set to a header rather than a paragraph. And the headers work um, very much like you would do an outline in Word. Uh, the lower the number, so header two is uh, more, important, more important or more prominent on the page than header three. So um, typically you can have multiple level two headings on the page and uh, maybe one or two level three headings. Most pages are not going to be so complicated that you would have uh, significant number of heading levels on there. But that's uh, the second thing is to just use your proper heading layouts instead of just making everything a paragraph and then just changing the font size manually. Uh, on that same note, when we're talking about using the proper formatting tools, the next thing to do is um, if you're going to make a list, so a bulleted list, a numbered list, use the true bullet and numbering tools. Sometimes people will do things where they'll come in and they'll, you know, do like the um, an asterisk or something like that to indicate a list. Um, instead of doing that, just make a true list. So, for example, if I have like item one, two, three, whatever, make it a true bullet or numbered list. Um, That, too, works much better for screen readers. So that's pretty straightforward. So do that as well for text. Uh, another thing with text, uh, try not to use uh, abbreviations, acronyms, things like that. It's better to spell it out because screen readers aren't necessarily going to be able to interpret uh, what, for example, an abbreviation is. One that I sort of commonly use that I have to train myself not to do is I tend to do you know, ETC for et cetera. It's better to just spell it out, uh, you know, so far, et cetera, like that. So hopefully that makes sense so far. I do have my chat open, by the way, so if anyone has a question, you can also just type a question into the chat window, and I'll pay attention to get you that way. Um, let's see. What else? Okay. So also involving text, if you want to make a link. Um, 
So let's say you want to link, for example, to the UNCG website, for example. I used to do it in this way because I thought that this would be more useful. I used to put the whole thing in there. And, you know, and in the scheme of things, the UNCG main site is, is not even that long of a link address, right? But I used to put the whole link address in there and then make this the link, thinking this was more helpful because when you look at the page, you can see the link as well as click on it to follow the link. But what happens when you're using a screen reader is behind the scenes, what the screen reader will read is it will read um, the code that's that's specifying the link. So in essence, it will read this whole www address one time as the link, but then it will read the whole address a second time as the text for the link, if that makes sense. So instead of doing this and then making the link as well, it's better to use short descriptive text for what the link is. So for example, UNCG um, website. And then the way you can highlight it and then click your link to URL button here and then put the link here and insert link. That works better. Another thing uh, that you can try to avoid, and I'm often guilty of as well, is let's say if you had a syllabus, um, a lot of times people will say something like uh, click here to download download the com complete syllabus. Right. And then what they would do is they would make click here the link. Really, it's the same thing. It's better to use uh, something a little more descriptive. So um, instead of highlighting click here, make that the link, use some text. So in the case of this course, let's say, um, you can say, Cities. And then I will make this short description the link to the syllabus. And that works better again with screen readers. So, uh, and the same thing with files. If you're linking to a file, you can do the same thing. Um, if, well, what you just saw with that. So, um, that is uh, text links, formatting with that. Um, uh, if there's no questions on that, I can jump on over to images um, in Canvas. So if you're doing an image, it's um, you first you insert the image on the page. So let's say I want my image to go up here. So I'll come in right there. So if I want my image to go here, I'll come over to images. And let's say I'm going to put this one in here. So I'll just click to put it on there. So here it is. So here's my image. And so with images, what you have to think about is, again, with screen readers, when they come to this image, um, unless you do something else, all that they're going to know is what this file name actually is, the actual name of the file. They're not going to know what really to describe it as. And if you have a visually impaired person who can't see this image, then you need to let the screen reader know what to tell this person about the image. And what that's called is alternate text, or uh, what you see is referred to as alt text. And the way you get to that, so you put your image into Canvas first, just like I have there. Then you select the image. And then you go to this image icon right here. And so if you click on that, you see right here where it says alt text. And by default, all it's going to put in there, you see, is the file name. You see it's got the .jpg here. It's just the file name. And that's typically not what you want. So you want to take that out. And for alt text, it needs to be something that describes the image enough to convey to the students what this image is representing. So in this case, it can be as simple as artist depiction of an Athenian. So that could work. If you get more complicated images, then you might need a little more alt text, and that's fine. It can be, the alt text can be longer. It doesn't have to um, be really short. So put enough text in there to imagine if you could not see this image, 
you need to convey to the students the information the image is trying to present, if that makes sense. And then just click update. And then your alt text is going to be in there for the screen readers to read to the students. Um, so that's images. I'll also mention that um, I don't, I'm not going to have time to open up uh, PowerPoint or Google Slides, but I will mention that you can, um, if you're working with PowerPoint or Google Slides, you, you can also insert alt text on the images there. Uh, it works almost the same way where you select the image and then look at the properties for the alt text. So you can do it in um, uh, well, Word, you can do it in Word, PDF, you can do it in Google Slides, PowerPoint as well. So you can put your alt text in there in all those ways. Another thing I'll mention briefly, too, is if you are um, using equations, um, years ago, uh, if we had someone, uh, you know, for um, example, in the sciences or in math, and they needed to do equations, we'd have to take those equations and um, convert them to an image and put them in there. But these days, and I see Courtney has a question, I'll touch on that in just a second. Uh, these days uh, in Canvas, we have the equation editor. So if you click on, you know, the little sort of square root icon here, you get the equation editor come up. And if you use the equation editor here to build whatever equation you want to put in here, then uh, you're good to go. That should be accessibility compliant. So use that instead of converting your images to some kind of graphic. So uh, real quick, Courtney's. Uh, question is, isn't there a character limit recommendation? You don't want your uh, alt text, uh, technically speaking, you can put as much in there as you want, but you don't want your alt text to, you know, be like a paragraph. There are there are other ways in, in the HTML code that you can put a much longer description in there, but for Canvas purposes, what you have access to is alt text. So what I recommend is, is just that you get your description in there through the alt text and keep it to, um, you know, one good sentence. Uh, it should be enough if, if that helps at all. And so equations. So um, we've got just a couple minutes left, and I think we can actually touch on everything else in that time. Uh, one of the most common questions I get as far as accessibility actually relates to quizzes. So I am going to um, save this page and I'm going to jump to quizzes because if you recall when I was mentioning uh, very quickly at the beginning all the different uh, categories of disability, attention deficit is one of those. And what uh, a lot of faculty get are students, and I will mention to students, if, if you're wondering how you know if you have a student in your class who needs uh, uh, you know, special considerations. Students have to go through the ORS office on campus and uh, fill out the appropriate uh, paperwork, and then the ORS office will contact you. Uh, the most common request from students is just for a, uh, additional time on quizzes. So if you go to quizzes, let's say you have quizzes that are timed, of course. So let's say this quiz here is timed. And let's say I have a student in there um, who, so the quiz is already timed for five minutes. So let's say a student has gotten um, approval through the ORS office for um, an additional five minutes on all the quizzes. What you do is, you see, I was on quizzes. I just click, click the name of this quiz. You come over here to moderate this quiz. And so let's say, you know, it's, um, well, Sam, for example, you find a, um, the student's name in the list, you come over to the pencil editing icon, and then extra time on every attempt. The student already gets five minutes, so if she's approved for five more, you simply type five and save. You will have to do this for every student. I mean, not every student, for the same student on every individual quiz. There is no universal setting where I say she gets five extra minutes for all quizzes. So you have to go for each individual quiz and set that five minutes for her every time. Uh, but that's how you do that, the most frequent, um, frequently asked question. The last thing I want to mention before we stop for specific questions is um, video. Uh, a lot of people really like to use video in Canvas, and we have this record, upload, media tool in Canvas now that makes it really, really easy. But the reality of it is that video, if you're going to use video in Canvas, it needs to have uh, closed captions attached. Um, and there's, there's kind of a, a lot to that. Um, 
the couple things to be aware of. One is that all UNCG faculty, staff, students uh, have a YouTube channel automatically. And so you can upload your video to YouTube, and YouTube will auto caption. It's, um, their auto captioning is getting better, but it is not perfect. But you can edit the captions that YouTube creates and you know, fix any errors, and that will give you captions. There is also a tool inside of Canvas that will let you create your own captions uh, if, if you're feeling ambitious. And then um, thirdly, and probably what most people want to do, is the provost has recently been approving um, a set amount of funds uh, that faculty can request to use to have their videos captioned for them through an outside service. And that money, I think, typically goes through uh, uh, DCL. So um, I haven't heard this year, I think, what the process will be for those funds. But I did hear that the funds were approved for another year. So that's excellent news. Um, and that saves you the hassle of trying to add those captions yourself. Um, so. That's excellent news. Um, I, the one thing I will end on before we take questions is a lot of people ask me, do I have to worry about this if I don't have um, a disabled student in class? And the thing is, it, you know, if you don't have one, then chances are no one is, is looking, and so you'll be fine. But then the issue that you run into is uh, as soon as you find out you have a student who, for example, is visually impaired, then um, you could find yourself having to get a lot of things compliant in very, very little time. And it's probably not a situation you're going to want to find yourself in. So I tell people, don't panic if you have a course and you haven't looked at any compliance at all yet. Just go ahead and start now and do a little bit you know, every day or every week. Set aside a little bit of time and, and just work on it, and then you'll get there. Uh, and then one last warning before I forget to, publisher content, like Pearson content, a lot of people use their textbook um, content and import it into Canvas. Just be very cautious with that because we have discovered the hard way that a lot of that publisher material is not accessibility compliant. Um, and that causes some major problems. Uh, so keep that in mind. So um, I think we need to stop and take questions now. Talk to super duper fast. I do have a resource link for you that goes over step by step everything I told you, but I can go ahead and take specific questions now, um, audio or chat, uh, whichever you'd like. Any questions? Hey, Anita, this is Sam. Hey, um, do you have any recommendations for um, Outside resources of Canvas, like you know, what to look for in terms of accessibility, like if you're putting things into Canvas, um, like a tutorial or like a website. Oh, like what to? Oh, oh, outside help for how to do things and then put it in Canvas. Is that what you mean? Well, like if you're putting in video, if you're putting in like a link to something, like things to keep in mind for out, you know, things that you aren't making in Canvas. Um, yes, I have uh, a lot of that information on the website that I'll uh, give you all when we wrap up here. Um, and the website also has some tools, like I mentioned before, the color contrast editor, that's on there as well. Um, I'll mention too, since because with you in the library too, it's worth mentioning too that a lot of people use e-reserves in their online courses. And the good news is that um, those are going to be accessible now, so you don't have to worry about that. There's PDF. And also with video, uh, the library has many, I think it's at least 10 now, streaming video catalogs that you can look through to find videos for your online courses. And um, uh, many of those videos come with captioning. And if not, they, you can request a version that specifically does have captions, and then that will be provided for you. So the library has excellent resources as well. Does that help? Does that answer the question? And you, you, you mentioned your website. Um, do you have on that website some resources that can guide people on how to write, um, how to write alt text? Um, I, I mean, how to write it. 
not exactly because I show you on the website how to insert it just like I showed you here but as far as how to write it, it just very generally because it depends very specifically on your circumstance because alt text I mean I sort of I mean I do describe what you need to do but alt text very specifically depends on what image you're putting on your site um, because you know if you have just a picture and then let's say it's a, a painting of Van Gogh you know that's pretty straightforward it's a painting of Van Gogh you know you can put who painted it the, the year there are a few additional details you've got there basically it's a painting of Van Gogh but let's say that you have um, a, an, an image that basically shows um, the life cycle of a plant you know, then you've got several different stages of the life cycle of the plant that you want to touch on there. So it, it very much depends on what image you've got on, you know, on your site that you're trying to put alt text for. So yes and no, if that makes sense. It is tricky because it is based on what they're trying to convey. So I think if anybody has any trouble, they can always reach out to their ITC for assistance. Anything else? If we're about to wrap up, then I can go ahead and, um, Amy, how would you uh, like me to, do you want me to give you the link and have you email it out to everyone, or I can put the link in the um, chat area and people can just copy it themselves? Let's do both. Uh, if you want to go ahead and send them the link, and then uh, when I send an email out to everyone that came today, um, I can send them that as well. Okay, sounds good. Um, I'm going to copy it and put it in the chat window. Just give me just a second. Otherwise, um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, we are going to send you a recording out of what, we, what happened today. And we do have more in our series coming up. Uh, we'll put that in our, on our website. You can see that. It's also in our newsletter that we send out to faculty every week. So keep your eyes open for more um, for in the series. And yes, thank you, Anita, so much. Thank you for coming. So Amy, I'm just going to close the meeting, or do you want me to hand it back to you? You can hand it back to me. Okay, I sent it back to you. Do you have it? Oh, well, there you go. I do. I'm going to go ahead and end the recording, but if you guys want to ask Anita more questions, feel free.